Hi everybody, this is Scott Stanchfield. I just finished this DSLs and Code Generation Tech Talk for Johns Hopkins University, and it turns out I forgot to start the recording for the first 10 or 15 minutes. So I'm re-recording this at home right now, you know, just standing at my computer recording it. Hopefully everything's going to go perfectly fine this time. Uh, let me just double check that I'm recording it. Yep, I'm still recording it. Good. I had to check that just to make sure. So let me minimize him so he doesn't show up in the recording. There we go. Yay! And onward we go. Let's start off by talking about data entry. As a programmer, it's pretty easy for us to enter data. We know what our code looks like. We know different ways to codify data. You know, we can put the code, the, the data in the code itself. We can put the data as a binary file that we read in. We could use comma-separated values. We could use <laughs> human-readable uh, XML. Yeah, right, it's human-readable. Uh, we could use JSON, which is a little bit more human-readable than XML, but not much. But non-programmers or subject matter experts are going to have some trouble with this. We need to get data from subject matter experts to chew on inside our code. Most subject matter experts probably aren't going to understand the code. And I'm not saying they're stupid or anything, it's just that they aren't coders. So when we give them something like XML or JSON, they're going to look at it and try to do the right thing, but chances are pretty good they're going to have some syntax errors along the way. And it's going to be a little harder to deal with. When they look at that, their first reaction is going to be to say, ew, and they're not going to like that a whole lot. Sometimes what we'll do is ask them to input their data in a spreadsheet, maybe in Excel, and then just save it off as a CSV for us to read in. And that can help. I mean, it's useful for tabular data, but if the data is any more complex than that, it might not work all that well. So, oh, the other problem we might have with spreadsheets is sometimes they use bad characters. Let's say that our code is expecting ASCII characters, and then they type in some of these curly quotes, like you can see on the slide right over here, these curly quotes around bad. Those will come up as you know, invalid characters when we read them in, if we didn't take that into account. So sometimes we'll lean back on XML or JSON and say, here, just put it in. They're human readable. <laughs> and then they're going to say ew again. It makes it very, very easy for them to make syntax errors and very hard for them to correct them. We need to spend time as programmers to validate the files and make sure everything's fine in them. This is where domain-specific languages can come in really helpful. The idea behind a domain-specific language or a DSL is it's a little language that you're creating. It's tailored more toward the way that the subject matter expert might speak, or for you as the program, tailored to make your life a little simpler by having less code that you're going to have to type in, make your data entry a little simple, uh, a little bit more terse. But as far as the subject matter experts are concerned, you can tailor it such that the terms in this little language are more familiar to them. A subject matter expert who's an epidemiologist, for example, may have a certain vocabulary that they're more used to than Java, for example. You know, they, we can use words that are much more specific to them. Uh, even take that a little bit further. Maybe in epidemiology, there's a subset where they're doing some disease surveillance. We could come up with some terms that are very specific and some language structure that's very specific for that specific disease surveillance task. This also allows us to do some better validation. Rather than XML being nice and generic and you can pretty much handle everything and you specify a schema for it, You'd have to get pretty specific on the schema and probably write some extra tools to do some validation. With domain-specific languages, you can build into the language some validation with the tools that you use to create the language. We're going to start by talking about something called an internal DSL versus an external DSL. An internal DSL is one that you actually use the programming language itself to implement. For example, in Java. We might use something called a fluent API, which we try to make the code read like a sentence. Create a new robot, turn left, move, and shoot. That's something that's a little bit easier to use, a little bit easier to understand, but it's still code. Somebody who's, who's modifying this could forget the dots, they could mess up the parentheses, they could have extra characters that are not digits inside of here. So it still takes some programming expertise to be able to use that language. Something that's a little bit more friendly, some languages like Groovy allow you to tailor it so it looks more like a domain-specific language. In this case, I'm going to make an email to Luke from Han, don't get cocky kid, have our body and send it. This is a little bit more usable by somebody who's not a programmer. It really feels like a little language that they're describing an email. 
If you want to get a little bit nicer, you can go to an external DSL, and these are completely outside the realm of code. In this particular example, I'm using GraphViz. They have this language called dot that describes a directed graph. Uh, so this particular graph here was saying I can go from the study to the hall and label that transition with south, kitchen to hall, label it east, and so on. And if we run this through the dot processor, it creates a little graph picture that looks like this. If you haven't used GraphViz before, this is a fantastic way of representing something as a graph. If you want to represent a state machine, if you want to have something that represents a network diagram, this can generate a graph. And you'll see in this case it has a few issues with some things being crowded, but there's extra parameters you can put on some of these to help with the spacing and things like that. This is just a really simple example, but you can see by itself this is actually still pretty useful. Then we'll look at a custom DSL for this little adventure game that we're going to be running here. This custom DSL describes the items, rooms, and where you start for an adventure game so that a writer can come in here and create this DSL and then we pull that into our code and use it to run the game. This is something that's a lot more usable for the writer than if they had to write enter this information in code. We'll see what that example looks like in a second here. So let's just go ahead and look at what these examples are going to be. First example, text adventure game. This adventure game is going to have two domain specific languages in it. One for parsing commands. This text adventure is going to have commands like go north, go south, git key, unlock safe, things like that. These commands are going to be represented in a language called Antler, another tool for language recognition. We're also going to have a different DSL implemented in Xtext to represent our data. And there's a reason why I'm choosing the two different parsers here. First of all, using Antler, this is a tool I worked on quite a while back. Uh, Terence Parr is the guy who, who runs the tool. Uh, I worked on like Antler version 2 a long time ago. Um, what Antler will let you do is, is match some input and run an action based on it. So if, if that's what you need to do is match input, run an action, Antler is just a really nice way to get that cranked out very, very quickly. You can do a lot more with the tool, but I'm just going to use it here because it's a simple way to match text, run action. Xtext I'm going to use for pulling the data in. And what's really nice about Xtext is when you describe your grammar, it will generate model classes for you at build time. It'll generate a whole IDE, so you have syntax highlighting, you have content assist, and you can also do code generation in it, which we'll do in the other example. And then we're also going to use it to read in a model instance at runtime. So this would allow our writer to create that definition file, and we pull it in and use the same game engine to run multiple different types of games. Our other example is going to be for generating an object model. This guy, we're going to have one DSL to describe that object model using Xtext. And we're going to build the model classes, generate an IDE, and then generate some code. I forgot to put a bullet on here to say generate code. So let's dive in. First of all, let's take a look at the this sample adventure game, just so you can kind of get a feel for what the adventure game does and for the initial code structure. Inside here, I've defined some objects for my model, like item. This is just a simple Java bean. He has a bunch of fields, and then he has some methods, is carryable, set carryable, get name, set name, and so on. And what these are going to do for us is allow us to create an object model. Our object model is read in from the game class using this code right here, define model. Now we'll see here that we have a very, very simple, very straightforward way of setting up our objects. New item, passing in some arguments to its constructor, the key, the name, the description, and whether it's carryable or not. These ones aren't too bad, but when you take a look at something like safe, look at all these parameters you got there. This is going to cause us some issues if we want to have somebody else enter this data for us. First of all, it's code, but second, how do they know which parameter is which? They're going to need to constantly refer to the documents to see what parameter is going to go in what place there. And it's very easy to mix up strings or mix up booleans in here. So this is going to create our items, create our rooms, and then we're going to add the directions between the rooms. We can't add these directions directly when we're creating the rooms because some of them are cyclic. You have between the porch and the hall, you can go both directions you wouldn't be able to reference the hall until it's defined. So that's a bit of a problem with this approach as well. Define our rooms, and then we have to add things separately. Then we create our model with all the stuff inside it, and we're good to go. Let's take a look at the commands. 
This is my command grammar that I've written in Antler. It's a little grammar that describes the language you can use to communicate with the game. For example, you can say get something from something. And a word is just a letter followed by zero or more letters. This could also be replaced with letter plus instead of letter and then star then letter star letter. I'm not sure why I did it the other way. I was just in a weird mood that day, I guess. And a letter is either lowercase a to z or uppercase a to z. So that combines these together here. This parser is going to do things when you match this text. So if you say examine something, it's going to call game.examine passing in the text of that word. If you say get something from something, it's going to call get from passing in the thing you're getting and where you're getting it from. So it's a very simple match the text and run something. I'm using a plugin for Antler inside Eclipse here so that anytime I save this file, it's going to generate some code under Antler Gen here. There's two pieces of code generated, a command lexer and a command parser. If you think about a lexer as being, well, let's, let's talk about how you read a book. When you take a look at a book, your eyes sees letters. You group those letters into words, and you see spaces that separate the words so you know when a word starts and ends. You then group those words together into sentences to figure out what's trying to be said in the document. What we're doing here is this lexer is going to be the thing that groups the letters into words. We call those tokens in compiler, to in compiler speak. The parser is then going to take those tokens, ignoring any white space, and he's going to group them into sentences, like get something from something. So if we see in this grammar here, down here, the uppercase rules, word, letter, and white space, those are the ones that go into the lexer. They take letters and group them together, and they throw out white space. The lowercase ones, those are parser rules. And these guys are the ones that take the words and group them together into sentences so that we can understand the meaning. Once we have that, inside our user interface, we have this little parse command. He uses that lexer and that parser to understand the input. So we'll see that he's taking the command that was typed in, creates a stream out of it, passes that to the lexer so we can figure out what words we have, what tokens we have, puts those into another stream that can be read by the parser. The parser then figures out what the words are by calling the command method. That method is generated from this rule. When we run that command, he will in turn run data inside of our game. And we have, so we'll have things like get description, go, and so on. So each of those methods will be called by the command parser. Let's run this and see what it actually looks like. Run as Java application. And you'll see that he says, this is the front porch of your house. You can go north. I'm going to say go north. Oops, had my caps lock on there. I'm in the main hall. Let me go east. This is where I sleep. Let me get a key that it has inside there. I'm going to go west now to go back to the hall. Let me go north from there. And now I'm in the study. This is where I pretend to work. I can go south and I see a safe. So let me examine the safe. It's a very heavy lock box. There's a keyhole on it. It's locked. So let's say unlock safe. I unlock the safe. Let me open the safe. And I'll examine it again just so I can see that it has a letter inside of it. Let me say get the letter from the safe. And we'll examine the letter. And boom, it reads you in. I've won the game. I can exit out of there. So that's the basic game, a real simple text adventure game like we used to play back in the 80s, you know, back in the good old days before we had wonderful, fun graphics. I used to love those games. So that's the basic version of this game. Let's clean things up a little bit. If you recall, down at the bottom here, we had some pretty verbose definitions using constructors to create these objects. We can tweak that by inside these classes, returning the this object from each mutate and mutation method. So if we say set carryable, we're going to return this, set name, we return this, and so on. And when we add items, we're going to return this as well. So anything that mutates the object, we're going to return it. This allows us, let's go to sample adventure 2, to now use a fluent API. 
So I'll create a new model, and in that model, add a key as a new item, set his name, set his description, set carryable, and so on. What's really nice about this is now we're not dependent on the order of arguments in our constructor. We've added in these methods here that allow us to set the properties and kind of chain it together as we're creating. So it's fairly readable. We can make this a little bit more readable by dropping the set on those. So if I go down to sample adventure three, what I've done here is each of those methods, let's go to item again, the set methods now, I just removed the word set. This makes it a little bit more friendly for when you're creating it using this Fluent API. Item, name is this, description is this, carryable is this, and so on. And so this gives us a really nice API to describe things. However, we still have a few issues as far as cyclic dependencies. Well, notice that I throw some variables up here, and as I'm creating the objects, I assign those variables. This is so that I can reference them. And we'll see that the safe contains the letter. So I had to define the letter first. That works fine here because none of the items have cyclic dependencies, so I can just put them in the right order. But for rooms, I can't do that with the room directions because in each of these rooms, porch can go to hall and hall can go to porch. So for porch to go to hall, I'd have to have hall defined first, and for hall to go to porch, I'd have to have porch defined first. I can't do it. So what I'm doing is I'm defining all the objects first, and then I'm setting up the directions the same way that I did before. So that's a bit of an issue as far as design on this. It really makes it a little more difficult to enter this data. And once again, having a subject matter expert, in this case, the writer of the game itself, it's going to be really hard to, to have them enter the data. So let's move the data outside. If we take a look at adventure.json, this is a JSON file in, in the sample adventure 4 that describes the exact same data in textual form. So what I'm doing now is defining all these, key, letter, and safe. Note that the safe references letter by name. And then in the rooms, I have the porch saying I go north to the hall, and the hall says I go south to the porch. They do it all by name. Now what I can do is read in this JSON file, define the objects, and then run a second pass to resolve any of the references so that I will figure out what rooms are connected and which rooms afterwards. This makes my code a little bit more complex. So if I take a look at the game here, down near the bottom, this method got a good bit bigger for defining the model. It's fairly straightforward what it's doing, though. I'm reading in the adventure JSON, setting up places to hold the rooms and the items, setting up some temporary holders for some data so that I can do that second pass reading the object for the items, the rooms, and the start room. So we have here items, rooms, and start room at the top level. And then for each of those items, I'm going to define the item object. So it's very similar code I had before, except now I'm pulling the data from the JSON, put the items in my items array, and then I'm going to hold on to that key if anybody defines a key so that later on I can resolve it. I'm also going to hold on to the contents for a specific item so I can resolve those later because like the safe contains the letter. We're then going to resolve the keys and the contents by walking through the items, pulling up the keys and contents for them, and then looking the items up inside that item array. We'll do something similar for the rooms. We're going to create the rooms, stash the exits temporarily, stash the contents temporarily, and then walk through the rooms and resolve the exits and the contents. Boom. That'll give us our, our model. So now we have the data completely outside of the program. We could even load up different JSON files using the exact same code and have a different adventure game run. Now keep in mind, this adventure game is a really simple example of an adventure game. It doesn't do much. Very, very simple language. In real life, you'd have something quite a bit more complex than this, and you probably have a much more robust language for it. Doing things this way is still quite a bit more error prone because the writer has to come in and edit JSON and they can do things like forgetting these commas. Maybe that's probably one of the most common things or maybe they forget the colons and it gets it very hard for them to interact with it. So what do we do to solve this? Well, let's create a little DSL to represent our adventure. I used Xtext to create these three projects. And when you say create an Xtext project, it creates multiple projects for you. 
And all I did for this example, the only thing that I changed is this xtext file. And this is a grammar for xtext that describes a little language that the user can enter their data in. So here's an example at the bottom here of what that language looks like. We have carryable item key with the description, carryable item letter with the description, fixed item safe, opens with key, it's locked, and it contains a letter. So we can see that this language is a lot more friendly. And what's really nice about this is that Xtext will generate an IDE for us that you can just hit control space at various points and it will prompt you for what comes next or what's possible to come next. When I take this, I compile it by running this MWE2 file. I'll just say run as MWT workflow. I won't run it now, it's already built. That will fill in the, the details in these three plugins and then I get to run it. This generates Eclipse plugins. Our IDE is going to run inside Eclipse, but I'm already inside Eclipse and I don't have those plugins present. So what I need to do is something kind of interesting. I need to run a copy of Eclipse inside Eclipse. So think of it this way. I create a program in Eclipse that I want to run and I run it. What if the program I'm trying to run is Eclipse itself? There you go, pretty simple. So I'm creating these plugins. I'm going to run that nested copy of Eclipse using these plugins. I can do that by right clicking and saying debug as Eclipse application. And it runs a new copy of Eclipse inside the outer Eclipse. Hooks up my debugger so I can debug things. And boom, let's take a look at what we got here. We'll go to sample adventure. And here is a little language that they can edit. Just by creating that one file, it created an IDE for me. It created a model for me so that when I load this piece of code, it creates all the objects that I can then use to do my adventure game. Let's take a look at what that looks like. I'm going to go down to the bottom here. Here's my new defined model. Note that I don't have all that code that I wrote by hand. It's now just some references to how to load something from Xtext. And in there, you're just setting up a resource, pulling the contents out, and boom, it's a model. So this code is just some boilerplate that you would just use for that. That creates my model loading all this data in. And if we take a look back in our project in the outer eclipse, I can take a look at source gen and underneath adventure DSL, we'll see that it's created interfaces for every one of those objects. Let's take a look at the grammar up here. Model has items and rooms and start room. Those are fields that are going to be created in the model. And he references the item rule one or more times and the room rule one or more times. And the start room is a reference to another room. So it's going to create model with items, rooms, and start room. Let's take a look at what he looks like. So inside here, I have this get rooms method. I have get start room and set start room and I have get items. Boom, that's my interface. He then also generates implementations for him. Oops, model. And we'll see here the implementation is a little more complex. There's a lot of stuff going on inside here. This builds on top of a framework called EMF, the Eclipse Modeling Framework, which has a bunch of really nice ways to dynamically get at your model so you can introspect on it. You can run things uh, dynamically without using reflection, so it's much, much faster. And uh, also plug it into several other types of tools. But at its core, it still acts like a basic Java bean where you can get and set things. So this grammar here describes my language, and it also at the same time creates my model, creates my IDE. And if we take a look here in the IDE, let's take a look at this fixed item for a second here. If I just take hit control space after this, it's going to ask me, uh, for which things I can do at that point. Now notice it has a comma here. That's because contains can have a comma separated list of things that it contains. I could put in a new item here. Let's say fixed item. I'm just hitting control space each time. Now it's asking me for a name. I'll say thing. And now it says I need a description and string. There we go. This is a thing. And then I hit control space again. And I can say opens with, and it gives me a list of all the objects I currently have defined so that I can reference those as a key. 
I'll say he opens with the key as well. I can say he's either locked or unlocked. Is he closed or open? Let's say he's open. And then maybe he contains something. And then again, list the list, list the things that he contains. So he contains a letter, comma, a key, comma, a safe. So you could do something kind of like that. It helps prompt the writer along the way with what they can do at any given point. And if they screw something up, it'll give them an error message. And it'll say here, required loop did not match anything at input safe. Now there's some validations you can do to make those error messages a little bit nicer. But this is much easier for them to edit than XML or JSON here. It gives them some support, and the syntax highlighting helps a lot too. Once I save that, then I can run the game, and it'll read this in at runtime. So let's go ahead and run it, just make sure it still runs. So we'll say run as Java application. So at this point, note that I have an outer eclipse running an inner eclipse, and the inner eclipse is now running this, this game. So let's say go north, go west. This is a room you never use and aren't really even certain why you have it. I forgot to have the game print out the name of the room. But that's the kitchen. I'm going to go east again, and we'll go east one more time. Get the key, go west, go north, unlock safe, open safe, get letter from safe. Well, you'd never know I played this game before. Examine letter. And there we go, you won. So it's doing the exact same thing, but a different way to handle the data. And this is a much more friendly way to handle the data for the user. Now, depending on who your user is, you can tailor it even more toward them. Onward we go. So now our next example, I'm going to go back to the outer workspace in Eclipse here to take a look at some object stuff here. Actually, I think, do I have in here? Let's look at, um, yeah, here we go. So let's first of all take a look at what problem we're trying to solve here. Let's say that I have a person class and an address class. So here's a simple little address with a street, uh, get and set the street, a city, get and set the city. So just a simple Java bean, that's all it is. And a person here, same type of thing. He has a name, age, is he alive or not, a list of addresses, and that's it. Now just a note on what I'm doing here with this list of addresses. This is the mutable list. So this is the thing that's actually going to contain the data and have things added and removed. This is an unmutable list. So I'm just wrapping it with a decorator that stops any of the mutation methods from working. They actually throw exceptions. When somebody asks to get all the addresses, I'm returning the unmutable one so that they can't modify it directly. They have to call my add address and remove address methods. This allows me to have a place, if I want to, I can put in uh, here a fire event to say the address list has changed. If I didn't do this, they could just say get addresses.add, and I'd never know that the data changed. Okay. Unless I put my own decorator on there that listened for every single mutation method. So this is a little bit easier way to do that. So now I've got these two guys. Let's take a look at a little sample that uses them. And this is kind of similar to what I set up in that model for the uh, adventure game. You see that I'm creating these objects, address 1, set street, set city, address 2, set street, set city, create a person, add the addresses, and then I'm just dumping the data. So if we run him, we'll see that he prints out all that information that just ended. Fairly simple, right? We can do the same kind of thing here to make this return the this object so we can have a fluent API. So we'll see now my sample code looks like this. And that's a little bit more readable, right? A little bit, little bit easier to enter the data. And you don't have to worry again about the positions of data going into the uh, constructors. But I really, really don't like typing. And I really, really don't like copying and pasting. Because what happens when you copy and paste? If I copy a getter and setter, I'm going to forget to change something somewhere, right? That causes all sorts of bugs. You know, I might, instead of having the, um, let's go to the address. Instead of having the, you know, if I copy this get street and set street, I might change it to get city and set city, but forget to change what variable I'm changing, right? 
So I want to generate my code. If I can simplify this and say I have an address that has a street and a city, that's really all I care about, right? And if it generate the rest of this mess, that's going to save me a ton of work and be more, more consistent. It's going to make sure that everything works really well for me. So let's take a look at how we can generate some code with this. I'm going to go to my simple object DSL, which again, I created a little Xtext project for it. And the first thing I did was set up a grammar form. And this grammar is very simple. He says the idea of a model is I specify a package. And I'm defining a rule that's a qualified ID. It's just ID.ID.ID.ID. So it's just a typical package name type thing. And then I have a bunch of classes and enumerations. My classes are going to be cla the word class, followed by the name of the class, open curly, followed by some field declarations. So it kind of feels a little Java-ish, but this is intended for me, the programmer. It's not intended for somebody who's a non-programmer. It's just a way for me to save time and be more consistent in the code that I write. Field declarations are either basic lists or primitives. So a basic field says I'm going to be some other type, like an address, and I have a name on him. Primitive field is either string and or Boolean. I could have all the other primitives. I just kept it simple here. A list field is a list of some, of some type. And then the name is here. And I added this little thing called singular on here so that I can create the add and the remove methods without the plural name. So if I added a list that I call addresses, I would say singular address. So that it's just going to, to have a get add address and remove address as opposed to add addresses. Just a little silly thing. Enumerations are just enum, some name, and then values. The values are ID and a string. Now, one of the things that I did with this and some code that I'm working on is I enhanced this enumeration type a little bit by having some other parameters added in. And one of the things that's cool about Java enumerations is you can have fields in the enumerations. So you can add extra data and have it generate all that for you. So once again, when I generate this grammar, it creates an IDE for me, creates the code to read this stuff in. It also creates a generator. And in the other project, we didn't use the generator. But this code generator here, I can come in and have it do whatever I want it to do. This do generate method gets called passing in a resource which represents that file. And then you say what you want to do with it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, look at all the contents and filter out everything that's not a model. So I'm just going to have models only. There's only one model at the root of this thing, so I don't have to worry about um, having more than one. For each of those, I'm going to say, find all of his classes and generate a class. Find all of his enums and generate a enum. This little language, by the way, that you're seeing here is called extend. That's with the letter X, T-E-N-D. And this is something that is built by the same people who created Xtext. It's kind of like a Java++. So they had uh, lambdas and things like this and functional programming in this before Java 8 came out. So for generating a class, I'm going to generate a file taking the, um, the class, uh, let's see, I'm going to find the model of the class, and all I do there is uh, say, get the container object for the class, which is the model, and cast it to a model. So I'm going to get that model and just find his path. So whatever the path to that was, use that. Uh, so it's, it's going to be the package. Let me find the, let me bring up the other guy so you can actually see what I'm talking about. Here we go. So here's a sample here. So I'm going to look inside the model, which is this whole thing. And this is listed as PKG. So if I took a look at the grammar, we see package and then PKG equals that qualified ID. So I'm going to find from the class what's his model. I just go up a level. And then I'm going to create a path from it by taking that package and changing all the dots into slashes. So that's going to give me a path on the file system to put him. Add in the name of my class, .java. And then here's the code that I want. Now they have this nice little uh, templating language here using these triple quotes. This is what the code's going to look like. Anything that's in these little double brackets are variables that get replaced or expressions that get replaced. So I'm going to say package, put in that package name without changing the dots to slashes. Public class, the name of it, 
and then for each of the fields, generate the field. So when I look at generating the field, here's what a basic field generation looks like. There's a field for it, there's a getter, and there's a setter. So we're going to generate this code, and we do the same type of thing for primitives. For lists, lists are a little more complicated. They have that unmodifiable thing that I was talking about before, the add and the remove method. Here's how to generate an enumeration. So he's going to generate that enumeration file. And when I run this, I get my IDE. And when I save this, it generates my code. Let's take a look at the generated code. So I'm going to go to source gen, auto one. Let's see what a person, let's look at the address first. Here's the generated address class. Looks pretty much identical to the one I wrote by hand, right? But that's all I had to write. Now imagine this when you have 50 model classes. And this was something, I, I, one of the projects I got on a few years ago, somebody else had been developing the model before I got there. And he was handling everything by hand. And so he had 50 model classes, some of which did things in a slightly different way than others. So they were inconsistent. And then he started getting new requirements from the, the sponsor. Oh, I want these model classes to be hooked into Hibernate. So we needed to throw in a bunch of annotations on everything. So he had a thousand places to go and add in these annotations. And I told him, stop right there. We're going to generate the code. So I set up something similar to this. And then in the code generator, have it generate an annotation. And boom, everything was fixed as opposed to having to go and add those things in all by hand. The person class, very similar, almost identical to what we did in the other, other one there. You know why it's almost identical? Because when I prepped this talk, I did the code generation part first and then copied the code over to the manual one. But this is actually how I would have written it by hand anyway. So, I mean, it ends up, you know, being how I wanted it to be. Now, what if we wanted to take this? You'll notice it doesn't have the return type being person and return the this on this, right? So what if I wanted to change that? Let me put the person and the address side by side. I guess I'll put him over here. So we have, here's our, our DSL, here's our person, and here's our address. If I go over into my generator, and let's take a look at for a basic field here, I want to tweak my setter here. So I'm going to say for the, the return type here, I want to get the class of that field that, that contains it and use the class's name. So I'm going to say here, field.econtainer, so I'm just going to get his containing object as class type dot name. So it's going to put the class name there. And then I can throw in here, return this, Let's do the same thing in these other spots. So for the setter down here, I'll change that. For the adds and the removes, for the lists, I'll change it as well. Then I'm going to add in the return this. And we'll do the same thing here. I've saved this. And I happen to be running that nested eclipse in debug mode. So when I change things, it hot swaps them. If you add a method or add a field, it'll, it'll say, sorry, I can't hot swap that. But if you change the contents of a method, hot swap works pretty well in Java. So when I go to this nested guy, watch what happens when I save my DSL now. Boom. So now in both those classes, I get all that code generated for me. And now these classes are kind of small, so it's not a huge difference. But again, imagine you had 50 classes you wanted to do this to. I did changes in what, like eight lines? In my, in my code generator, and now I'm getting the appropriate type here and the return this on every one of these. So now the code that gets generated here, let me go to auto two. I'll see that the generated code down here, let me actually get some of these out of the way here so we can see what we're doing. My generated code has, whoops. Did I save that guy? There we go. So the generated code has that return type and return this. And now I can use that same type of Fluent API that I couldn't do before. Kind of neat, huh? 
Now, what's really awesome about this is that you can have this code generation do anything you want. It can generate code, it can generate XML, it can generate, you know, I'm using it in Android to generate a whole bunch of layout files. Let me show you a little example of what some of that looks like. Come out of here. And my machine is about to take off. So I have a much more complex model here, which I happen to be in the middle of editing. Oh, that's I'm not going to be able to show you the actual generation of it. Um, but let me go into the nested eclipse. And I can just show you what the little language looks like. So here's an example of a much more complex domain-specific language that I'm going to use to do much more code generation. You'll notice that these class definitions look kind of similar to what I just did there. You know, class something. I added in the idea of having superclasses. And then fields. So the fields are almost identical to what we just saw. I have a little bit of extra information up here that lets me have some dependencies. Uh, it lets me say the application name for generating some Android code. Um, any specific folder I can put my generated code inside of. I have some enumerations here, which we'll see have my display names in parentheses here. So this is something I could actually hand off to one of the people I work with who defines this data, and he could enter this for me pretty easily. And I tell him, don't touch anything else. Just stay there. You touch anything else, you die. Um, and then, down here... I can define my forms. I'm going to generate an Android. So each of these is going to define what's going on on the screen. So I can have a little form for an air collection instrument that's going to have a little table of name and the value, manufacturer the value, flow and the value. And I have these little expressions to say how to get the data out of the model. This in turn generates the XML in Android, which has data binding expressions that use this type of syntax here. And Let's see. Anything else interesting down here? You can see this file gets kind of big kind of fast. Um, I need to break it up so that I can have separate includes and things like that, which I don't currently support. Um, then I define my top-level activities that are going to be used in Android, which forms they use. Those forms can include other forms. So they can create a nice form there. And when you select something from the tree to say, you know, hey, here's a plan I want to work on, Boom, the form comes up with all the data populated. Lots of stuff is generated from this guy right here. If I went into my code generator, you see I have several code generation files here. Um, I have something to generate the activity classes, to generate the models, to generate the binding adapters, which say how I convert data from my model into the things that are going to be displayed in Android. Enumerations factories for these guys so you can create instances of all the classes. The form information there. And then some basic support at the top level to actually create my Java classes for me. So through this code that I've, I've developed here, it generates tens of thousands of lines for me that I don't have to maintain by hand. And this has been nice because the customer is constantly asking for changes. And sometimes I'll need to tweak the DSL. Sometimes I'll tweak the code generator. Other times, I'll just be messing with the code itself. But this saves me from having to deal with the model, which is a huge, huge benefit, especially you know when I have, I, I think there's about 60 classes in that model right now. So it, become, it becomes quite a bear to maintain. OK, any questions on that? So those are a few things you can, you can uh, take into account. Um, be careful with code generation. Don't look at it as a golden hammer. I mean, every once in a while, you know, I'll do one of these talks and somebody will hear something and say, wow, that's cool, and they try to force it on everything. This is a great tool if you have redundant code somewhere. So if you want to try to, um, you know, the, the same kind of pattern, not necessarily the exact code, but the same pattern over and over again. Code generation is a fantastic help on things like that. Um, but sometimes people will say, oh, I can just generate everything, and then they create this DSL, which... Some of the stuff in the DSL would have been easier just to code by hand. So be careful on things like that. Try to use it for something that you're going to go from terse to big when it's generated. OK, make sense? And that is pretty much all I had for today. Any questions? 
And Eclipse, by the way, is better than NetBeans. I heard you guys talking about NetBeans back there. <laughs> I've, been, I've actually been using Eclipse since... Uh, I used to use Visual Age for Java and uh, back in the late 90s. And uh, then IBM killed that just after I wrote my book on it. Uh, I, was, I, wanted, I wanted to strangle somebody. It's like six months after the book comes out. Boom, no more tool, no more book sales. Uh, and um, then they came out with Eclipse. And so I got used to Eclipse. Yes. Wow. <laughs> now, let, let me caveat that with this. I haven't used NetBeans in about 10 years. I have heard it's gotten better than that. Um, typically, I use uh, IntelliJ and, and uh, Eclipse. And IntelliJ, I could speak to a lot more on that. Um, the biggest thing that I like about Eclipse over any other environment I've seen is the way they do incremental, uh, incremental compilation. So when I'm in here and let me switch back to the other workspace there. And it's taking off. So if I came into this guy here and I make a change to my item, like let's say I want to change the name of this method. As soon as I save it, everything else that depends on it gets compiled for me. I don't have to do a separate build, and it's really fast. Uh, in IntelliJ, for example, if I want to see that type of thing happen, um, in, inside the current file, it'll show you bugs as you're editing. But when you, uh, unless you do a build, you won't see how it affects other files. And, and the builds take a while. So a lot of it is development speed. I mean, it's, since I've been using Eclipse, it's just so fast to do things. Um, unfortunately, Google switched from Eclipse for its Android development to IntelliJ. And there, it, the equivalent support for doing Android development is just not in Eclipse anymore. So I, I had to move over. And I'm cursing it pretty much every day. <laughs> it's, it's really just, I mean, the way I'm doing my development right now, you notice that I just showed you that DSL for the, big, the project I'm working on? I do the model development in Eclipse. It generates code into some directories. And then in IntelliJ, he uses those directories as source. So I actually have both IDs up and running at the same time, which is not terribly pleasant. But the, um, the support for uh, Xtext just isn't there in, in uh, IntelliJ yet. They're working on it, though. Yes? OK, so I actually have a question about code generation. Mm -hmm. Sure. IDEs. <laughs> uh, so um, so with the game example and with the beans example, you know, those are pretty trivial. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so I've, you know, that, that first part, you know, generating the, the code that, that doesn't change mm -hmm. is, is pretty easy. But you get into this ugly situation where, you know, I want to generate some boilerplate so I can insert those behaviors, but then I can't generate the boilerplate anymore because I'm stuck with it. Ah, OK, I see where your question's going. So the do you have a solution? Yes. Uh, there are actually several solutions to that. Um, so the question to kind of boil it down is uh, sometimes I want to tweak what the generated code looks like. That's kind of what it boils down to. You need to, you need to do some extra customization because maybe the code generation itself isn't, um, you, you can't do everything you want in the code generation or you want to do something cons uh, special. Um, one thing you could do, and this I do not recommend, is enhance the DSL to have much more complexity to it so you can do anything you want in it. And that's generally a bad idea. Um, right. There, is, uh, there are some ways in Xtext, there's an embedded language they call Xbase, which is basically th all the stuff that's in Extend with Lambdas, it's Java syntax type things like that. You can just include in your grammar. So you could say, you know, in your uh, DSL, well, let me just throw in a... Uh, Oh, did I switch the wrong workspace? Yeah, I did. Let me come back in here. 
Come on. Okay. And we'll run the nested guy here. So one thing that you could do is add in some syntax to say method, and then this would be X base stuff inside here, which can then generate Java codes. That's one thing you could do. I don't recommend that because that it you, you still want that extra flexibility. So there's a couple approaches you can use that are basically design pattern approaches. One of them is called the generation gap pattern. And what you do is you're going to be generating a subclass. And then you as a, uh, well, you generate either a subclass or a superclass. It's up to you which one you want to generate. And then as a programmer, you come in and you insert either the superclass or you insert the subclass. And let's see, do I have a good example of that one? Um, trying to think of, oh, I do have it in that other. Let me switch back over to this other one again. So one of the things that I did with this project, uh, there's a new untitled, is I have a little hierarchy that looks something kind of like activity, which that's from Android. Underneath that, I have a class called base activity, which is handwritten. And then as subclasses of base activity, for each activity you define in that file, I might have collection activity, planning activity, and a couple other things. And the code generator generates something called collection activity base. So that's generated. And then I come in and create a subclass of that called collection activity, which extends it. Now what this does for me is you'll notice that there's handwritten stuff in two spots in this hierarchy, one at this top level and then one at this lower level. This lets me define methods up here and fields up here that this guy can use, all the generated code can use. This one lets me extend the generated code to add additional functionality, call methods inside of it. This is a really, really popular way to take care of generated code and allow you to have customizations. And you can keep customizing this and never touch your code generator. And this, this has proved just fantastic for me. Um, now, I actually extend it a little bit more than this with another generated thing in here. I'm just going to call it methods. Uh, how, how do I want to word this? I'm going to call it iMethods. It's an interface that gets generated. This guy let me show you what it looks like in the file. One of the problems I had is that I didn't want to be restricted by what code I could reference inside my DSL, but I wanted to keep it simple. So I have a list of methods that I define, which are basically just the, the method declarations, not the method definitions. And so these generate an interface, which is this iMethods guy. And then I have a, I'll just call it a methods def class, which is a handwritten guy that implements him. So having this guy and this guy implement him, I'm ensured that the definitions in here Sorry, the declarations in here match the definitions in methods def. So I can't have those two out of sync. And then this guy here, through a lot of the code that's generated for these uh, uh, expressions, uses those methods. You can call those methods. So by putting different hooks at different places in your class hierarchy, you can accomplish a lot of that. Now, it doesn't solve everything. One of the other problems that I had was that in some pieces of code, you want to have something that's generated be able to be used in multiple places. That's when you start looking at the strategy pattern. And so what you can do in your generated code, let's say I have a, a foo class that's generated, inside there, have it generate an interface. So call it i, oh, it might be a good uh, updater. And he might have an update method. And then somewhere, and he, he has a set updater method that takes that updater. And where you're going to use it, you could say, you know, something x and do an x dot add new foo. 
dot set updater new i updater with the update method defined inside of it. This is just, you know, real rough pseudo -e code type thing there. But the idea here is that this guy, and if this extra functionality that I wanted to run for the update, I'm letting somebody else pass it into me. And so that way, a, a little hole where normally I would have had to have something in the model that, you know, lets you specify random code, I can instead have a little interface that says, here's where the random code goes. And you just plug that in with whatever code you want to use. So these are a few really common techniques that people will use to be able to modify the, the effect of the generated code. I don't want to say modify the generated code because I'm, I have a very strong opinion that generated code should never be modified. There are some tools, um, I'm trying to remember which tool it was, there were some uh, GUI generators for Eclipse when Eclipse came out fairly early that you could put it, you take the generated code and you could add in some special comments that said, you know, my code starts here and then put in your code and then my code ends here. And it would do a merge activity on it. So it would generate new code, take a look at the old code and merge your special blocks back in. Um, I think that's just gross. <laughs> and that's something where this type of approach I think works a lot better because it's a lot more explicit what's happening. Um, and if something changes in the code generator, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, with that Eclipse version there, if someone decided, oh, we're going to, you know, now that I have this ability for the user to put in blocks, I have to keep supporting that forever. And as opposed to something like this, it's like, you know, you just throw in code wherever you want it to that way. So does that help answer your question there? Okay, so the question is, how many of these tools work with non-Java languages? Um, the nice thing about code generation is that code generation doesn't care what the target is. You can generate XML, you can generate Java, you can generate Groovy, Haskell, you know, whatever. Does, you could, okay, okay, well, you could generate C++, or you could generate Python that generates C++, you know, whatever you want to do there. Um, and uh, the code generator itself, I really like this set of tools using Xtext, and that's all Java-based. So if you wrote that in Java, with the, uh, is this the right guy here? Yeah. With this, these extend classes, which are kind of like a Java++ for doing your code generation. Um, in this particular case, you'll see that for my code implementation, I'm uh, returning little objects that represent pieces of the code so that later on I can put them wherever I want to put them. Um, you could use Java to do your code generation and have it generate C++, whatever you wanted to behind the scenes. Um, and then that works just fantastically. So it's like I've, I've in uh, this Eclipse, uh, in this Android project, it's generating the layout files. It's generating uh, Android code, uh, Android Java code. Um, there was a couple other things it was generating. What was it? Um, I had it generating a manifest file, which is XML. So you can have it doing, you know, any type of thing you want from the code generation. Um, and that's something I like uh, better than a lot of framework type code because frameworks generally you have to have the exact same code in every different language. Um, although sometimes that's useful if you if you have your code generation. Oh, it's another thing. You could actually have your code generator targeting multiple languages. So you could have it generate Java. You could have it generate C++. And the code's going to obviously be different from both, but it could be very similar, at least the style of it, the pattern that's being being uh, implemented. Oh, but yeah, Java is Java right now is is my main focus. Okay, any other questions? Yes. So the question is, will the code examples be available? And I'm going to post those at Java Dude. So what you're going to see is at um, I'm not connected to the network right now, am I? Let's see if that'll get me in. Okay. There we go. So at javadude.com, boy, I have to really work on this website. This is so 90s. Um, if, we go to <laughs> if we go to articles, um, it's microscopic too. Uh, I'm going to put in a new one up here that talks about this tech talk. And uh, 
what these will do is these will jump off to where the videos are hosted. Uh, I will probably put this on Vimeo. Um, so I'll have a link to the Vimeo place and um, any type of sample code for each of those will appear there as well. And you can see I have a bunch of other, st other videos here, you know, to, uh, things I've done as tech talks or tutorials. Um, I try to put them up here as much as I can. So think of javadoo.com as kind of an index for where I have my other stuff. Okay, any other questions? Thank you for asking those questions, by the way, about the uh, you know different types of code generation things. Because um, yes, yeah, sometimes people will come to a talk like this, and it feels like yeah, everything you know, it's always just trivial stuff. But yeah, I mean that's that's huge. I mean being able to inject your own code in different parts of a hierarchy is probably one of the the best ways to do it. You know, between that and the strategies, that covers probably ninety percent of your code customization right there. Okay, any other questions? I think the timing worked out pretty well on that. Yay, just about an hour. <laughs>